those who have been caregivers, those who currently are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregiving. That's all of us. We learn from the moment we are born that life cannot exist without care. Over one billion people around the world rely on a caregiver to go to work and earn a living, to nurture a child's development, to provide for an aging parent, to support those with a disability. Care work is often the invisible foundation of human progress. Behind every major achievement lie countless moments of care that made it possible. I love the phrase care economy because whether people want to admit it or not, caring is at the base of the economy. Globally, 16.4 billion hours are spent in unpaid care work every day. If paid even a minimum wage, this work would amount to 9% of global domestic product. Never before has this issue been so urgent as when the global pandemic upended many forms of care, as well as our entire understanding of care itself. And the world ground to a halt. Yet care work and caregivers did not, but they remain at the fringe of discourse, undervalued, undersupported, overwhelmed, and overdue for solutions. We cannot let up. We must continue to harness the world's attention and ideas and turn them into action. I believe that we will win! I believe that we will win! We must find solutions, both community-driven and institutional, to provide better support for caregivers. I couldn't imagine my life without the relationships that have sustained me when I have needed them and have given me the opportunity to be the sustainer. Together, we can build a future that brings the universal experience of caregiving to the forefront. Our loved ones, our communities, and our world depend on it. Please welcome Ai Jen Poo. There's a metaphor we all know, the idea of the tip of the iceberg. Even though most of us have never seen an iceberg before in real life, we can all imagine that beneath the waterline is a whole majestic mountain of ice. It's an idea that challenges us to imagine and understand beyond what is immediately visible to us. When we think of the economy, we have all kinds of associations. Wall Street, business leaders, manufacturing, restaurants, retail, agriculture. What if I told you that all of that is just the tip of the iceberg and that there's a vast expanse of economic activity underneath what we see that is the foundation of everything else? And that foundation is care. It's obvious on one level, people power the economy, human beings. From the CEOs, to the managers, to the workers and consumers, it's all people. And people have families. And all of us rely on care. From the time we are born to the time we leave this earth, we rely upon the care of our parents, our caregivers, our domestic workers, our child care and direct care workers, Care is a universal need across age, culture, and ability. But for most of human history, we have separated what we think of as productive, real economic activity from our caregiving. It doesn't count in the same way. Globally, 16.2 billion hours are spent in unpaid care work every single day, which, if paid a minimum wage, would amount to $11 trillion per year. Access to child care, to care for older people or disabled people, makes it possible for all of us to participate in the economy. But as it remained below the waterline of what we see and what we value, in the economy. 
held quietly by overstretched, unpaid caregivers in our families, or underpaid women working as care workers who earn poverty wages. Women like Susie Rivera, who has cared for older people in New Braunfels, Texas, since she was 19 years old, and sees it as her life's calling. During the pandemic, she worked 80 hours per week, making sure her clients were safe, that they had support, medication, food, and supplies, and most importantly, that they knew they were not alone. In the United States, 20% of care workers live in poverty. And about 5 million children in the US will lose their childcare at the end of this month because pandemic rescue funds for childcare have not been renewed. Around the world, through all the changes in our culture and in our economy, and living through a global pandemic even, care remains undervalued and largely unsupported. As developed nations grapple with growing aging populations, as working parents grapple with the need for childcare, and all of us in the sandwich generation struggle with both, the demand for care workers is exploding, making care jobs among the fastest growing occupations in countries like the United States. And by the year 2030, the number of people worldwide predicted to be in need of care will reach 2.3 billion. The lack of access to care is one of the biggest drivers of inequality that no one talks about pushing women in and out of the workforce, trapping workers in poverty, forcing people into poverty to qualify for services, and it's only going to get worse. Our failure to see what's below the waterline has created a global care crisis. But the headline here today is not crisis, it's opportunity. We have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to invest in care, in child care, in paid leave, in aging and disability care, in an economic model where we generate agency and dignity throughout the iceberg. We could create millions of good new care jobs that won't be outsourced or automated, Jobs that will not only support the workers in those jobs and their families, but all of us who rely on their work, allowing us all to participate in the workforce with the peace of mind, while knowing that the people in our lives who matter the most are supported to live healthy, full lives, and ensuring, importantly, that our caregivers are cared for too. Care is the foundation of the economy, and investing in care is what will make an abundant future truly possible around the world. Thank you. And now, it is my great honor to welcome to the stage my dear friend, the brilliant Chelsea Clinton. Let's give her a warm welcome, y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Aijin, for that a very warm introduction and for kind of situating our conversations this afternoon um, with the more than appropriate urgency and yet also I think quite clearly the opportunity, as I just said, the once in a generation opportunity to build a caregiving ecosystem with dignity and agency that actually works for everyone, particularly our caregivers who have too often been underpaid, certainly, uh, but also undervalued and exploited. And we do not have to take the history for granted. And in fact, as I Jen, I think called us, to be bold in our imagination to think about what a different world would look like when we centered caregivers, uh, those of us who are, those of us who will need them, um, kind of in the focal point of urgency that we all deserve to be 
the country and the society that I think we often believe that we are, and yet the data so evidently says we're often not yet. I am incredibly, though, uh, proud and invigorated by the next set of commitment makers and their commensurate commitments, because they are certainly collectively um, leading us toward a place of greater dignity, kind of agency, and support for caregivers here in the United States and really all around the world. And so I will ask you um, to maybe hold your applause until they all make their way to the stage. Um, I tried earlier with the applause after each person came to stage, and it was incredibly exciting, but also, I think, slightly disorienting as people are trying to hear their cues of when to walk out. So I'm trying to be a slightly better stage manager. Um, so please uh, join me with enormous kind of heartfelt, though at the moment, silent welcoming <laughs> for the following commitment makers. Tamika Sullivan of the Chiricahua Community Health Centers, Kieran Bai of Making Caring Common, Lesha McCormick of Last Mile Health, Jennifer Schechter of Integrate Health, Katherine Harrison of the Skoll Foundation, Shahed Alam of Nora, Valerie Rochester of Creating Healthier Communities, Phyllis Height of the Missing Billion Initiative, Buddy Shaw of the Clinton Health Access Initiative, Lorena McDowell of Step Up America. Now, could you please give them a big round of applause? <laughs> These change makers are thankfully not short in ambition with their wide range of Clinton Global Initiative commitments that they are announcing today to really help build and then edify a future in which caregivers are valued, validated, supported, and giving, given the dignity that they certainly deserve. Nora Health and the Skoll Foundation, in collaboration with physicians, nurses, public health practitioners, and technology experts, are committing to develop comprehensive and adaptable training programs and resources in South Asia and Southeast Asia to help patients and their caregivers navigate short-term and longer-term medical care and recovery at home. The Missing Billion Initiative and the Clinton Health Access Initiative are committing to improve health outcomes for 200 million people living with disabilities around the world by increasing the capacity of the healthcare systems in the countries in which they li live to better provide inclusive care providing blueprints to support health worker training and developing pre best practices around equity that can hopefully be replicated across the world. Step Up America is committing to convert motel rooms into studio apartments in cities across North Carolina to house 500 people who are experiencing chronic homelessness with the opportunity to scale up and expand to other parts of the United States. Step Up America will also offer supportive services like case management, life skills training, and social support groups. Chiricahua Community Health Centers is committing to reduce morbidity and mortality of people with substance use disorders in Cochise County, Arizona, by focusing on workforce development training for providers, expanding their capacity to provide the type of addiction therapy and treatment care that everyone deserves and ultimately expanding access to that treatment and care. Creating Healthier Communities is committing to address persistent health disparities for black mothers in the United States by expanding its black birthing initiative in Indianapolis, Indiana. Among other things, this commitment aims to increase the doula workforce and establish a birthing center specifically for black mothers. Making Caring Common is committing to address the mental health challenges faced by teens here in the United States by providing mental health support and resources to 100,000 teenagers and their caregivers. A support toolkit will provide information on better understanding and then alleviating anxiety and depression. 
Last Mile Health, Integrate Health, and the Clinton Health Access Initiative are committing to improving primary care for millions of people living in Ethiopia, Guinea, Liberia, and Togo. Their programs to support and strengthen gender responsive community health care will promote better health outcomes and reduce preventable deaths. These commitment makers are certainly not only reimagining the way care is provided at every stage of life and across the spectrum of human experience and around the globe, they are also leading in proving what is possible when we build a care economy that truly cares for everyone, including the caregivers. Please give them all a very big round of applause. Please welcome Eddie and Dopu. Oh. Hello, CGI. <laughs> I stand before you today, figuratively, of course, as a living embodiment and as proof that indeed there is no contradiction between being disabled and productive, being disabled and valuable, and dare I say, being disabled and fabulous. Indeed, disabled people are your neighbors, we are your colleagues, we are your friends, and we are part and parcel of your community. I want you to imagine a fearless, dynamic, single mother in early 1990 South Africa, and this mother gave birth to a young boy, and the doctors told her that this boy would not live beyond the age of five, and that if he does, he won't be able to enroll in the mainstream education system, that he won't be able to attain a dignified life. Little did that mother know that that young boy would not only outlive himself by 30 years and counting, he would go on to graduate from Oxford University, become a best-selling author, and be appointed by the Secretary General of the United Nations as a global advocate for the Sustainable Development Goals. I am here to say, Mom, you did it. And my mom is among the countless of caregivers who sacrifice so much to ensure that they are able to carve out dignified lives for those that they care about. And so I am here really as a tribute not only to my mom, 
but to all caregivers all over the world, and to say that yes, through grit and resilience, it is possible, but that grit on its own is an insufficient corrective for institutional and equitable change. And so it is my invitation to all of you that we recognize the fact that caregiving is the backbone of our society. And when we reimagine care and recognize that without care, we don't have a viable economic framework for all of humanity, that is what it's going to take in order for us to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And so, like my mom, I'm going to keep going, and I hope that you will walk beside me. I thank you. We know that young children are among the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So this conversation and the actions that come from it today are critical. We know firsthand what's happening at the Clinton Global Initiative because we're working with people on the ground who are living it. Climate change is a behavior change issue. We need to make better and different decisions. We need to empower our youth to understand what that means and what they can do. I feel like this is the space we're in with this climate work, is that the early childhood field is ready. So how do we get everyone else ready to be a part of this and really take action? Here at the Clinton Foundation, you know, through Too Small to Fail, through the Clinton Global Initiative, and we aim to build multi-sectoral partnerships that really kind of set out to do big things, um, but we're not in the business of inertia or passivity. And so what's the narrative? What's the change that we're going to make? So when kids 20 years, 30 years from now, they're telling this same story about something different. So we have to get out of the box and try big, bold, new things based on science uh, for what is most important for our kids and their health. I have been doing work on kids' issues for 20 years and on climate issues for 20 years, and this is the first room that I've been in where those two issues are together. We're very grateful to be in a community of doers and to figure out kind of what we can really begin to do together on these uh, desperately urgent and crucial issues. Please welcome Darren Walker, Governor Gavin Newsom, and Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton. I am so glad to have both of these guests with us because um, I've long admired uh, what each has done and the issues they've tackled and the results they've gotten. Uh, and I'm thrilled that we're having this whole plenary session on the care economy and what caring means. Uh, and this panel will be followed by another terrific panel with more uh, specific recommendations that Chelsea uh, and uh, the panelists she will have will be focused on. Um, but I wanted especially to talk to Darren, president of the uh, Ford Foundation, and uh, Governor uh, Newsom, governor of California, who um, has been working on these issues uh, as well, because we need solutions. We need to know things can work. We need to have leaders um, in the not-for-profit uh, philanthropic sector, obviously in the public sector and the private sector, who take these issues seriously. As Ai Jian Pu said in the beginning, it is like an iceberg. Everything else we do, I don't care what field of endeavor you're in, is built on a foundation of caregiving. And therefore, it's just as Rosalind Carter said in that great video, there are only four kinds of people. People who have been cared for, who are being cared for, who will be cared for, or will be themselves caring. So it's very much uh, in the spirit of this that uh, 
We look at how the care industry is the fastest growing sector in the world from child care, elder care, disability care. It supports over a billion people, a billion people in both formal and informal uh, roles. But the work is chronically undervalued and underpaid, and it's no coincidence that most of the workers are women. So we have to find better ways to empower and support uh, the workers who make up the care economy, uh, but also to make it affordable for the people who need care. That has always been at the heart of the dilemma. So let's jump right in. Um, Gavin, you obviously um, are in a unique position. Uh, you happen to be the governor of the fifth largest economy in the world, uh, Soon California. To be fourth. Soon to be fourth, okay. Yeah, I'm in, I'm just, eat your heart out, Germany, but uh, <laughs> we're not there yet. Forgive me. <clears throat> And you have just led a $2 billion increase and in expansion of child care for working families with low incomes. And you've expanded California's paid family leave from six to eight weeks. OK, number one, how did you do it? And uh, <laughs> what, what are the lessons that you know, others can uh, take from what you're doing in California? as to how you can help parents, workers, employers try to really grapple with the care economy. Well, you did a wonderful job sort of level setting and framing this conversation. We did it because we had intention. We did it because we frankly had neglected this space for too long. We did it because we said that we were going to do it. Uh, we did it because it needs to be done. Uh, we set forth a vision uh, under a master plan in the state for early childhood education, a vision for master plan for uh, seniors and those with disabilities, and then we laid forward a strategy on workforce development. And in that sort of Zen, uh, that sort of Venn diagram, came a framework of focus, and that advanced a two point now six billion dollar commitment for 200,000 subsidized childcare slots. It advanced a paradigm that you were considering that's incredibly important to us, and that was empowering the workforce, not just subsidizing costs, but empowering the workforce by unionizing the workforce. And we had the biggest unionized expansion in this space in American history two years ago, led by SCIU. And as a consequence of that, not only are wages rising, reimbursement rates are rising, consciousness and focus in the legislature has risen, and now we are funding more programs and doing more in this space than frankly we could have ever imagined. So I'm proud of that. In addition, in closing, the six to eight weeks is a down payment on what I hope one day I can attach myself to, which is six months. That's our goal. Uh, that's our goal. That's hard. It is hard. The six to eight weeks was hard. Uh, and last year, we expanded uh, those that actually can get uh, that leave, so there's more flexibility. That was hard. Uh, so we're on the, you know, that's a journey. We were able to advance that in 2019. Now we have more work to do. But this, to me, is just foundational, not just as a parent. Uh, we know in terms of this crisis, crisis of belonging, this dignity deficit we're all trying to address, uh, this sense of social isolation. I mean, this is so foundational to our fate and future, and that's why I'm honored to be here with you uh, as a champion for decades on this uh, and a practitioner as well for decades. Thank you both. Well, I am, <laughs> I am delighted um, to hear about this uh, commitment. I want to get back to you with some of the questions that um, members of the audience and others might have about how you did it, how you pay for it, and you know, what's in the future. But I want to turn to Darren first, because you know, one of the things I love about you, Darren, is that you were in the very first class of Head Start students in America. When we developed that Head Start program all those years ago, you were one of those little kids who went to Head Start. And I've heard you talk about it. And I've heard, about, I've heard you talk about what a difference it made to you. How has that influenced your commitment on you know, furthering um, gender equality and disability rights in the context of the caregiving economy work that you've been working on? Thank you, Secretary. It's great to be with you. And of course, Governor, uh, it, it has affected me because when you grow up poor, you have a lived experience that informs how you see the world. 
And what I find in philanthropy is that there are not many people who are presidents of foundations who grew up poor. And so it gives me a perspective. It gives me a perspective often of what it feels like to be excluded and marginalized. My mother was uh, a caregiver, a low paid black woman, because you said women, they were mostly black and brown women. Mm -hmm. And those women are not valued. And we see it in this city every day. In my neighborhood on the east side, on Madison Avenue or Fifth Avenue, you see black and brown women walking with an older white person, escorting them, sitting with them in the park, in restaurants, because they are alone but for that woman. And the salary, the compensation that that woman is receiving is almost poverty wages. So one of the real challenges we have in this society, particularly among we affluent progressives, is reconciling our own behavior with our rhetoric. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, is do we ask, because all of us have someone, and do we ask, how much are you actually being paid to take my mother to Central Park every day? And do we then raise hell with the provider when they tell us what they're actually making? Right? So, so there's, there's that dimension of my own experience. But then in philanthropy, the question of what should philanthropy be doing here? And of course, you've been a champion of this from your earliest days with your friend Marion Wright Edelman and the Children's Defense Fund on these issues on the front lines. And it is so important that philanthropy get behind these kinds of initiatives because they were your partners too, Governor, in helping you get it done. Yeah, 100%. And the role of philanthropy is to sometimes support the agitators, the troublemakers, the people who help you do what you want to do yeah. and who give you cover you when you need, who invest in the research and the data and the information that gives you the evidence you need to make good policy. Right. But we in philanthropy aren't doing enough of it because we worry about funding the troublemakers <laughs> and about the risk associated with certain kinds of organizations who are out marching, who are out making those who are powerful account and be accountable to the very public they're supposed to serve. So we've got work to do in philanthropy, and we certainly can do more and do better at Ford, but with people like Ajin Poo on my board, I feel good about <laughs> yeah, how we're right. going to do it. <laughs> yeah, it'll be all right. Well, you know, everybody should just remember John Lewis's uh, encouragement to cause good trouble, and that's really uh, what you're talking about. And, you know, Governor, you've done this, and a lot of people are going to say, well, that's California. You know, California, Life they do easy. these things. Yeah. Um, Give me a break. We don't know how they do it. We don't <laughs> know where the money comes from and yeah. you know, all of that. Not and so part of the challenge is, as, as you speak about these investments, what did you say, $1.46 to? Just on the workforce. Yeah. On the workforce. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, look, a uh, couple thoughts, and I want to get to that only yeah, California. Uh, <laughs> You know, there's the old um, adage that says, once a mind is stretched, it never goes back to its original form. It was philanthropy that stretched my mind as a candidate seeking the office of governor. I didn't understand um, enough about poverty. I thought I did when I was mayor of San Francisco, I was lieutenant governor, but I didn't understand that our interventions came too late. I, I was focused zero to five, not zero to three. No. I was focused on Head Start, not early Head Start. Right. I was focused post-birth, not prenatal care. And you shifted that mindset. You allowed me to understand that 85% of the brain uh, within the first three years is developed. Uh, that people aren't left behind, they start behind. And all of a sudden started shifting 
our policy framework. So then I promoted a promise in a campaign. I said, this is what we value. This is what we prioritize. And the language of the 60s, we want to eliminate ignorance of poverty and disease. This is the way we do it. People were frustrated about the persistence of childhood poverty and poverty and the like, generally wealth disparities. So what are you going to do differently? And we set forth that commitment. It's general fund money. It's not new taxes. It's again, statement of values, your budget, what do you value? It's reflected in that priority. And it didn't come from the legislature first, it came from the governor. It was a commitment that the administration made, enhanced by the legislature, and with the expectations of philanthropy, supporting advocates to raise the bar of expectation of performance. But I gotta tell you, nothing empowered me more, and this is not me just you know, asserting a, a labor paradigm for a purpose of a politician doing so. Nothing prepared me for the power of organized labor entering into this space to change the conversation. And that conversation, you want to talk about wages. We're not just talking about wages. We're talking about benefits now, and we're talking about careers, and we're talking about the dignity of this workforce, and as a consequence, now being able to recruit more people into this workforce, which is our number one challenge going forward, 1.46 billion reasons why we attach that commitment, but it's a drop in the bucket unless we make this sector of our economy a sector that people look forward to entering into, not some place they fall back into. You know, <laughs> Governor, Explain to us the payment dilemma, because I've had a million conversations about care, care for the elderly, care for children, care for people with disabilities. And one of the questions always is, but how can the people who need the care afford the care if you increase the wages of the people providing the care? Because whether it's the example that Darren gave of you know accompanying an elderly, uh, person to Central Park or caring for somebody with disabilities uh, who needs 24-7 care. How does the payment formula actually work? Well, I mean, it, look, uh, candidly, we're subsidizing those child care slots. That's, that's that $2.6 billion. And it's not just the slots, it's the quality. We don't just talk about slots. We want quality. I want outcomes. And, and we've moved away now from slots. We are looking at quality, which means we're investing in facilities, which is a big part of the quality uh, dilemma. I had $273 million last year just for facility, facilities improvements. There's a physical issue, it's not just the human capital. We also did something, and I'm really proud of this. And we talk about childcare in the traditional sense, but one of the profound dynamic changes in California is we created a brand new grade. And I can't believe we got this done. We created a new grade, pre-K for all and we connected it to prop, what we refer to in California, it's called Prop 98. It basically locks in the funding through a formula for public education, and it allows for a percentage of the entire budget that goes in to now the pre-K through 12 system, and provides three and four year olds that high quality experience as well. And so that was another strategy, a twin strategy for locking in that commitment and letting people know that we're gonna be here in the long run. This is not a situational commitment. This is a sustainable mindset. And that allows us again to focus on quality. And I think it's important that people start uh, making comparisons. So, you know, the federal government, state governments, we subsidize a lot of things. Exactly. We subsidize oil and gas exploration and extraction, for example. Uh, we even subsidized Tesla for Elon Musk uh, in the time when he was trying to get started. Oh, yeah. We subsidize so much when it comes to the business side, say nothing about agriculture. Why do we do that? Because we assume, sometimes correctly, that we need to get that subsidy out there in order for this activity to not only go forward, but produce some kind of uh, profit so it can be fed back in. So when you talk about subsidizing care, that shouldn't get people all up in arms. They should think, okay, that is a value judgment. Absolutely. And Darren, one of the things you're, you've been doing is to build at the Ford Foundation a strong and just care economy for over a decade. You've been working on this, you've been funding it, you've been looking for pioneers and people like 
Ai Jen Pu, who you know uh, are at the cutting edge of what it means. And in 2021, you, along with other leading philo uh, philanthropic organizations, announced the formation of the $50 million Care for All with Respect and Equity, the CARE Fund. So how is this going to work? And are you looking at the full spectrum of caretaking? Because, you know, we saw Eddie out here is so inspiring. And, you know, the people with disabilities, we want them to be able to live as full a life as possible. Children, we want to get off to a good start. The elderly, we want to have, you know, lives of dignity, people along uh, the whole age spectrum. T talk to us about what your vision for that care uh, fund is. Well, the $50 million is being distributed primarily to nonprofits working to advance policy change. And it funds organizations like the National Domestic Workers Council and many other organizations across the country. And at the core is the idea that most, that, that we foundations have organized ourselves in lanes of grant making that do not align with the way people live their lives. So the way in which most communities are organized are not by our program areas. Be and I use my own, my own mother again as a, as a her life was, was deeply intersectional before Kimberly Crenshaw was born. <laughs> and she, because she was a poor black woman in rural America who had mental health issues and who was raising four children on our own and trying to make a life and to live with dignity, which for a poor black woman in rural Texas in the 1960s was hard to come by. And so how do we fund in a way that recognizes, as our beloved Judy Human used to tell us, it's all intersectional, to imagine race, gender, disability, so many other dimensions of life and identity. How do we fund organizations who themselves have that mindset? That means that some organizations have to transform themselves. There needs to be new organizations with some of this money who didn't exist a few years ago. And then there's some legacy organizations who just need to go out of business because they are still in an analog ideology in a digital world, right? And so how do we help those organizations to, as a funder to say, we're not gonna fund you anymore <laughs> because you aren't able to evolve the way you need to evolve. Um, and so that's the work of the fund. Right. Well, it's so exciting to hear the two of you talk and I wanna give each of you just a minute or two to sort of sum up where you would like to see uh, this vision for caregiving that each of you is working on uh, end up? Where, where are you headed, Darren, with what you're trying to uh, accomplish? Well, for me, it's, this is deeply personal. I would love to imagine it is possible to, to be my mother and to imagine a life, a livelihood with dignity. Imagine being able to actually um, pay your rent, not have your kids come home to eviction notices on the door, not have your son at his debate club waiting you, not knowing that your car has been repossessed and you can't pick him up. Allowing, imagining a productive economy, a prosperous society that actually values a segment of our society, primarily black and brown women, who we have never, ever in this country's history valued. Is it possible to imagine that that group of women can live with dignity? Wonderful vision that everyone should be, as you hear, motivated by. And finally, Gavin, for you, what is your your hope well, for this? You know, uh, well, that's a hell of a question to ask me after that answer. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, it's interesting. In the, maybe I can sort of 
connect back to your point about California. I feel about our state, you know, we love to say about California, the future happens in California first, where America's coming attraction. In good ways and more challenging ways. Uh, when we started that master plan for aging, it was with a recognition of this golden wave, uh, this aging and grain population, of which I have now entered into, uh, the silver tsunami, as some have referred to it, and the fact that we have a state uh, of dreamers and doers that disproportionately was aging and grain. And we were unprepared, are unprepared. We started to frame this notion of not just an agenda in that context, uh, but looking at two generations. And the experience that I had with my father with dementia mm. in a wheelchair that came back to my sister's home and we converted the garage mm. and we struggled to find in-home support service yes. and to supplement what we were receiving uh, with private dollars. Uh, and all of a sudden, that deeper recognition. And so for me, it's part of that larger agenda, and it's part of that larger narrative, and it's part of our values of who we are. And I think uh, if my wife were here, she would also offer this insight. Um, we also want to bring to light that care agenda, not just from the more traditional workforce, but traditional roles in the house. And men have a little explaining to do. Uh, we have to step up our care responsibilities as well. We place too much of that responsibility on women. And we have a responsibility to recognize that. And I think that's also an important part of the dimension of the conversation that needs to be brought into this debate as well. Well, that's amen, amen. Um, so thank you to... Governor Gavin Newsom to President of the Ford Foundation, Darren Walker. Uh, stay tuned right after this now, an, yet another dynamic panel talking about how we're going to make all of this work, how we put into action this vision that the two of them have shared with us. Thank you both. Thank you. Oh my God, I love your end with Jen. I can't, I've seen her tonight. I can't The Aurora Prize for Awakening Humanity is the flagship program of the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative that seeks to address humanitarian challenges around the world. The prize is a global humanitarian award that recognizes and supports individuals who put themselves at risk to save the lives, health, or freedom of those suffering as a result of violent conflict and major human rights violations. Each Aurora Prize Laureate is given $1 million, along with the opportunity to continue the cycle of giving by allocating the majority of their prize money to help the most destitute. This creates a ripple effect that has impacted the lives of over 2.7 million individuals across 56 countries and territories, facing war, displacement, conflict, persecution, and other humanitarian issues. The Aurora Prize exemplifies the concept of gratitude in action, celebrating the power of the human spirit that compels one to act in the face of adversity for the benefit of others. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Nubar Afayan and Lord Ara Darzi of the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative and Jamila Afghani, the 2022 Aurora Prize Laureate. Good afternoon. It's a privilege to be with you today. And when I think about it, a bit of a miracle. Let me explain. My grandfather survived the Armenian Genocide, but only just barely. Destined to a brutal death, the fate of about one and a half million Armenians between 1915 and 1923, he and his brother were rescued by German soldiers who gave them papers, uniforms, and ironically, employment with the berlin Baghdad railway construction then underway. That saved them from certain death through a death march in the Syrian deserts. Half a century later, when I was 13 years old, my family fled the civil war in Lebanon, just days before the airport closed for the next four years. Welcome by Canada, we forged yet another new life. 
Such stories fill me with gratitude, the seed for what became the Aurora Prize you just heard about. Founded in 2015, the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative commemorates the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide and honors its victims, its survivors, and those who championed them. The birth of Aurora is due in large part to one of our co-founders, the late Vartan Grigorian of the Carnegie Corporation, who remains a guiding light in all that we do. But while rooted in Armenian history, our mission is global. We celebrate and spread the work of modern day heroes, people saving and changing lives in extraordinary ways, often at risk to their own lives. To cite just two examples, Dr. Tom Katina, who received the Aurora Prize in 2017, is the only doctor permanently based in Sudan's war-torn Nuba Mountains, home to more than half a million people. He typically treats up to 500 patients in a day, is on his own call 24-7, with patients often walking days to reach him. Dr. Tom, as he is known, often works without electricity, running water, or a telephone. His hospital grounds have been repeatedly bombed, and yet he carries on. Jamila Afghani, who received the Aura Prize in 2022 here with us, has championed Afghan women and girls for more than 25 years, securing their rights to go to school and live free from domestic abuse. Forced to flee after the 2021 Taliban takeover, the next time she's been a refugee, the sixth time that was that she became a refugee. Jamila continues her fight against gender apartheid from Canada. Now today we announced the Aura Today, we announced the Aurora Humanitarian finalists for the next year's Aurora Prize to be awarded on May 9, 2024 in Los Angeles, which will be our eighth such ceremony. Aurora Prize laureates each receive $1 million, 800,000 of which goes to grassroots humanitarians and organizations that the laureates select. This trust-based model stems from our belief that such choices are best made on the ground by community leaders. Our focus is on the human side of humanitarian care. We believe that even in the darkest times, a brighter future is in the hands of those who are committed to giving others help and hope. We welcome all those who share that vision. Please consider joining us as we put gratitude into action. Thank you, Nubar. As chair of the Aurora Selection Committee, I am honoured to represent here my acclaimed co-members, including Nobel laureates, renowned humanitarians, business leaders, and former heads of stage. state. Together, we face the immense challenge of choosing just three humanitarians from more than 700 submissions from 75 countries. I'm pleased to announce that the 2024 Aurora Humanitarians are the following. Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja from Bahrain, a human rights advocate who has been fearlessly defending the most vulnerable communities, especially those who have been subject to system, systematic violations of their human rights. Mr. Al Khawaji is currently serving life in prison for his involvement in peaceful protests during the Bahraini uprising in 2011. Dennis McQuiggy from the Democratic Republic of Congo, a gynecologist and human rights activist who has been working since 1999 to provide medical, legal, and psychosocial aid to women subjected to sexual and gender-based violence, and to advocate for gender equality and the elimination of rape as a weapon of war in the DRC and worldwide. Nazreen Sotudeh from Iran, a human rights defender who has been working as an attorney since 2003, 
representing Iranian opposition activists, young prisoners, and women rights activists, including women who were arrested for protesting against compulsory headscarves in Iran. Due to her work, Mrs. Sudue has been frequently imprisoned, including in solitary confinement. Congratulations to those extraordinary individuals, and we look forward And we look forward to announcing the Aurora Prize laureates, as said by Nubar Afayan, in May of next year in LA. My sincere congratulations to uh, 2024 Aurora humanitarians uh, by empowering everyday modern heroes, Aurora, remind us our common humanity and gave us hope. Thank you, Aurora, and congratulations to the newcomer humanitarian actors. Thank you. Please welcome Yin Chang and Moonlin Sai. Today, we gather not only to share our stories, but to invite you to join us in reimagining elder care, a cause that has become deeply personal to us. Rewind to right before 2020 when the world was just about to grapple with the COVID-19 pandemic. At that time, I found myself consumed by news reports, especially those highlighting the growing food insecurity and the challenges faced by our neighbors. It was during this deep dive where I came across a video of an elderly Asian man in Oakland, California, enduring racial slurs and having his collected cans stolen. It was gut-wrenching to watch as his tears and attempts to communicate despite a language barrier took me back to memories of my own grandma who raised me as my caregiver. The pain of not being fully understood, the language barriers, the isolation, it all resonated with both of our family experiences. Though thousands of miles separated us, in that raw moment, the vast distance felt like mere inches. We were connected to him by threads of shared heritage, pain, and resilience. That video was not just an isolated incident. It was a reflection of the broader challenges and injustices endured by Asian American older adults echoing in cities and hearts across the nation. These stories of dreams, resilience, and aspirations often go unheard, but why? Far too many Asian American older adults are living in under-resourced and under-invested communities. The harmful model minority myth portrays Asian Americans as universally successful, which overshadows and often invalidates genuine hardships and oversimplifies the diverse experiences within our community. For perspective, a staggering 28% of Asian American older adults in New York City live in poverty, surpassing the citywide average of 16%. Combined with linguistic, socioeconomic, and cultural barriers, many Asian American older adults are not given access to essential resources, leading to food insecurity, loneliness, and depression. One specific example of this disconnect is being given items like canned tuna as a meal. Imagine our elders, many who suffer from arthritis and are not familiar with canned tuna, struggling to open these cans. It's not just the physical challenge, but it's also the deepening their feelings of displacement. With memories of our own grandparents in mind, we set out on a mission to remind them that they belong, they are valued and seen. We started making dishes where every bite carries the aroma of familiar warmth 
and nostalgia while ensuring that these meals came in easy to open containers. While many might see food as mere sustenance, we view it as an embrace, a gesture steeped in love, respect, and cultural significance. We aim to not only feed, but to nourish, honor, connect, and cherish. On the cusp of Chinatown in the Lower East Side, this deeply personal revelation set the stage for Heart of Dinner and transformed our modest 300 square foot apartment into, <laughs> you understand, into the pulsing heart of Heart of Dinner. On our journey as romantic partners turned co-founders, we started off making meals on our barely working electric stove, 18 inches. <laughs> Imagine the two of us navigating that space. There are many heated debates over who misplaced the soy sauce and where the fried shallots went. <laughs> Our meals evolved into comprehensive care packages. Moonlin immersed herself in cooking meals that our grandmas made for us growing up, while I meticulously built out the care packages, filling them with culturally resonant vegetables like bok choy and pantry staples like bags of rice and mung beans. I also added warmth and cheer with handwritten notes and playful doodles. After our first two deliveries, we quickly realized that creating 200 meals, while helpful, was barely making a scratch of the surface of the many homebound Asian American elders living in New York City and joined hands with local businesses. Our growth and evolution were further amplified by an incredible community of champions, donors, partners, volunteers, and our incredible team. Their unwavering kindness and generosity have been instrumental in shaping our trajectory, enabling us to not only sustain, but also scale Heart of Dinner. Since our inception in April 2020, come rain, snow, or heat waves, we have never missed a Heart of Dinner delivery. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Together with our steadfast community and a small but mighty team, we're proud to have delivered over 160,000 meals across Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens, addressing food insecurity, loneliness, and social isolation among Asian American older adults living in significantly under-resourced and under-invested communities. Our care packages are filled with nourishment and cultural touchstones like bok choy, a symbol of prosperity in many Asian immigrant households, and notes, handwritten notes, written with heartfelt sentiments in our elders' various native languages. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've been able to turn the tide, challenge stereotypes, and illuminate narratives perpetually overlooked through empathy and love. And today, we are announcing our commitment to action Within the next three years, we aim to develop Heart of Dinner's dedicated delivery infrastructure, including onboarding a fleet of electric vehicles and a trained team of drivers that uplifts our community's nuanced needs. This will allow us to enhance our services, advocate for sustainability, and aim for a 25% surge in care package distributions and expand our reach to include the Bronx and Staten Island, ensuring Heart of Dinner serves all five boroughs. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and subsequent to this, we set our sights on a national leap, introducing Heart of Dinner to California. Heart of Dinner is about nourishing souls, uniting generations, and redefining the very essence of care, connection, and community support while amplifying local businesses and championing sustainability. By supporting local efforts and fostering global volunteerism, we strive to create waves of positive change that begins in New York City and transcends beyond borders. From two hearts that thrived in adversity and created Heart of Dinner as a sanctuary, we invite you to partner with us, bringing your expertise and financial resources to propel our mission forward. Join us in reshaping narratives and building a world where love and dignity are foundational human rights, one meal and heartwarming note at a time. Thank you.
Please welcome back Dr. Chelsea Clinton. Uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon, although maybe now we're actually at good evening territory. Um, I'm incredibly honored uh, to have my dear friend, uh, Dee Dee Bertram Farmer, next to me. Uh, we heard from her this morning, and um, what you didn't hear is even an iota of the extraordinary work that this extraordinary woman has been a leader in. Uh, she leads an organization uh, today among kind of her myriad of other works that works to advance and protect gender equity in Haiti and Rwanda by empowering young women to exercise their human rights and to take control of their own destinies. And I know that Dee Dee's late husband, Paul Farmer, who was a very dear friend to me and many of us here in this room this evening and a hero, I think, to all of us in uh, the work of trying to make the world a more fair, equitable, and healthier place would be very proud of Dee Dee today. And you may remember, last year that we announced the Dr. Paul Farmer Health Equity Pillar to serve as the home of all of our existing work in global health equity, as well as the home of all future partnerships and commitments to action that aim to carry on Paul's work by making quality healthcare more accessible to more people in more places and to build a robust public health system as a reality everywhere around the world and to ensure that in pursuit of both of those goals, we are not only prioritizing but centering our efforts in places where inequalities are having the deepest, most destructive impact on people's daily lives, on their health, and on their communities. And certainly one such area is maternal health care and reproductive health care. And so today, we are launching the first CGI Action Network under the Dr. Paul Farmer Health Equity Pillar. We're launching the Reproductive Justice Health Action Network that will focus on bringing together partners to tackle our reproductive and maternal health care challenges here in the United States. Our partners are ferociously committed to making maternal health care and reproductive health care more accessible, more equitable, and more inclusive, and ensuring that women are the ones making decisions about our own health, our own bodies, and our futures. Our efforts will also center reproductive rights for adolescent women and girls. Curtailing girls' reproductive rights infringes on their also equal fundamental human right to go to school, to pursue their professional dreams, and ultimately to be the author of their own futures. And we need to provide more support to mothers, and especially young mothers, to recover and to attain health and to be the best moms that they feel called and want to be. And yet we know that action networks are only as strong as the people and the commitments who comprise them and who are committed to the cause. And so I am incredibly uh, proud uh, and excited to be in this hard, necessary work with an extraordinary group of champions. And I would like to invite a few of those to join Dee Dee and me on the stage now. I'd like to invite my friend Christy Turlington of Every Mother Counts, Carly Kloss of Code with Klossy, Charles Johnson of For Kira for Moms. Oh, I'm speaking faster than they can walk. I apologize. Angelina Spicer, who is a comedian and maternal health advocate. Because while maternal health and reproductive health and reproductive justice are certainly global issues, they are also deeply American ones. As I believe all of us here in this room know, the United States is an outlier when it comes to maternal health outcomes and access to reproductive care. In fact, the US has the highest maternal and infant mortality rates of any high-income country. And black women in the United States are three times as likely to die in childbirth and postpartum as white mothers are. 
and black babies are twice as likely to die as white babies are. And those painful, horrific statistics were true before the growing restrictions on abortion access and quality reproductive health care. And so we are facing enormous threats everywhere in the world, but particularly here in the United States. And I think too often we absolve ourselves of responsibility for taking care of our challenges, our families, our friends, and our communities at home when we focus on similar challenges and urgent pressing needs elsewhere. And we have to be able to do both. We have to be able to continue to work on improving maternal health and access to quality reproductive and health care everywhere outside the United States and also here at home. Because I refuse to live in a country where my daughter is going to have fewer rights and a more dangerous future because of our failure to regain rights and protect reproductive health care access and to secure it well into the future. This is both a global issue, a deeply national issue, and for those of us here in New York City, a local issue. Because while we may like to believe here in New York that we are at the apogee of all things, particularly during UNGA week and CGI week and climate week, and I'm sure there are lots of other weeks happening in this singular week, <laughs> if you are a black expectant mother here in New York City, you are actually nine times as likely to die in childbirth and postpartum than a white mother here is. So our statistics here are even worse. And either we can be overwhelmed by that into inertia or galvanized because of these extraordinary champions on the stage to think about what more we can do quite literally here at home. Here at home in New York City, here at home in the United States of America, and here at home across our globe. And so we know that we need every champion and we also need every commitment that we can to address these challenges. And so I certainly hope that all of you will join me not only in thanking our champions and thanking the commitment makers that I'm about to announce onto stage, but also in joining this work. And so now it is my great honor to announce Melanie Fontes Rainier of the United States Department of Health and Human Services onto stage, Phyllis Dickerson of the African American Mayors Association, and my dear friend Claire Pierre of Mass General Brigham. And here's just a little about what each of these extraordinary women are doing to help advance and protect maternal health here in the United States. The African American Mayors Association is committing to developing and distributing a maternal health toolkit for participating mayors and make sure your mayors are participating and business councils to reduce black maternal mortality rates. The toolkit will provide best practices such as strengthening city health departments and providing employees with health coverage that offers comprehensive sexual and reproductive health care. Mass General Brigham and partners are committing to implementing two programs to address disparities in maternal health care access by expanding access to health care and offering supportive services for high-risk patients. These services will provide access to doulas and offer guidance and assistance all throughout pregnancy and postpartum care at no cost to the patient. And additionally, there will be wraparound obstetric supportive services, mental health care services, social services, and more. And finally, we want to recognize and thank the Biden-Harris administration's Department of Health and Human Services, which is committing to update and enforce the federal patient privacy rule to protect women from having to disclose or being forced to disclose private health information that is currently being used to limit access to reproductive health care, even when they are seeking it in other states than where they live. And so we are so thankful to have people leading on the front lines of advocacy, on the front lines of providing care, on the front lines of our federal government, on the front lines of our cities, and thankfully, as we heard from Governor Newsom earlier, thankfully in many states, on the front lines of our states. And yet we know we have so much work ahead, and so shamelessly, I'm going to once again ask 
all of you to join me with as much kind of commitment as I have no doubt that you will join me in as loud applause as I certainly think all of these extraordinary women and men more than merit. So please applaud and please join us so we can build a country where all women are respected, empowered, and protected. Thank you very much. <laughs> I got an excuse. Yeah. We need to send a birthday present or something. <laughs> so, this is enough. Right, so he is here on his son's birthday. How old is your son turning? He's turning nine today. He's turning nine. What's his name? Charles. Charles. Charles so, the fifth. Okay, so there are a lot of cell phones here. Can somebody like pull out your cell phone? Oh. Oh, I don't know, and then Charles is going to tell you like where to send it for Charles V, and we're all going to say <laughs> happy birthday. Does he go by Charles V or the fifth or Charles? Or you no, know, he's these days it evolves, and today I think it's kind of he's in the CJ phase now. CJ. CJ. All right, can yeah. we have a happy birthday, CJ, very loudly? Let's just do three for simplicity. One, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, CJ! CJ. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you all so much. much. That was amazing. Thank, Thank you. Oh my God. Oh, he has a picture. Let's help we need a picture. Commitments to action are new, specific, and measurable projects and programs to address the pressing global challenge. They're examples of what can be done and how you can do it. And the commitments people make at CGI really do matter. First, each commitment helps address an urgent challenge. But perhaps even more important is that they're done in a way that models the kind of behavior that supports democracy and strengthens our society that argues for why cooperation is better than conflict and inclusion is way better than division. Some people may say, oh, you're just making incremental change. But if you look at the commitments in the aggregate, there's nothing incremental about reaching half a billion people in 180 countries. It's not incremental change for the child who can go to school for the first time, or the person who can access life-saving health care or who can start a business to support their family and lift up their community. That's transformation. Please welcome Lejeune Montgomery Tabrone, Jen Lee Koss, First Lady of Iceland, Eliza Reed, and Dr. Chelsea Clinton. Thank you all for being here uh, with us, and thank you all for also still being here with us. I know it's been a long day. I think, though, this is an incredibly important conversation, um, and I just want to jump right in, uh, although I realize I say that while staying seated. Um, you know, and, and First Lady Eliza Reed, we talk so much. In fact, I was just reflecting on the challenges we have here in the United States, and we certainly heard you know, from Aijin and uh, so many others today focused on the care economy, on kind of the unfinished business of women's rights, which is intimately connected to conversations about the care economy, given how overwhelmingly um, both women in the formal and informal care, or excuse me, people working in the formal and informal care economy are women, um, and how far we are to real gender parity here in this country and in so many countries. And yet in Iceland, um, you have not quite achieved gender parity and equity, but you've gotten quite close and are continuing to make progress. Um, what can you share about what has worked from a policy perspective, 
kind of a private sector perspective, a cultural perspective, you know, to bring Iceland to where it is today, which is truly almost gender parity and equity for women. Thank you, and we, we emphasize that almost a lot because although we top the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index, that doesn't mean we've achieved it, it just means we're a little farther along than some other countries, and I think it's important for us as well to remember that in Iceland. But you're right that I, th I think, you know, gender equality is not something that's just gonna happen on its own accord, or certainly not fast enough for anyone's liking. And it is a combination, as you mentioned, of, of policy changes, of cultural changes, things in the private sector, public sector. And really for the last decades, there has been a conscious movement across governments and everywhere in society to work towards greater equality. And those uh, policy-wise, those include things like uh, parental leave that's paid for by the government that is for both parents. So uh, in heterosexual couples, fathers have to take paternity leave as well. Heavily subsidized child care. We have quota regulations for the boards of publicly traded companies. We have a law that larger companies have to prove that they are doing equal pay for equal work. So there's a lot of different policies there as well. We have a lot of strong female role models. We have almost 50% women in parliament. It's the highest uh, non-quota regulated representation in the world. Um, you know, but I think, and, and, and because of that, you know, culturally we see that. We had a female president in 1980. We have a female bishop of the national church, head of our police force. And I, I think really the, the, one of the key things here is that in Iceland, we've sort of passed the tipping point of debating whether working towards greater equality is something important, but how we are going to get there. And we know that it's not a zero-sum game that is, is putting down one group at the expense of another, elevating one group. It's something that is going to benefit everybody because the more gender equal societies we have, the longer living the populations are, the happier they are, the more prosperous they are for people of all genders. So this is something that is benefiting everyone in the country, not one group at the expense of another. And people now believe that because they felt that in their own lives. Right, exactly. You can see the results of this coming closer. Although I hasten to add, you know, we, we are still persisting and have work to do. And as we see from the global pandemic, things can happen that can set you back if you don't keep your eyes on the prize. Yeah, Lajeet, I actually think um, the First Lady provided a very good segue to the question I wanted to ask you, uh, which is that while, you know, more than 50% of large employers, you know, cite kind of the absence of an affordable childcare um, ecosystem in this country as a barrier to hiring enough qualified people for open positions. Um, we don't actually see real leadership yet in a coordinated, bold way from the private sector. And I know that at the Kellogg Foundation, which has now for decades been focused on you know, policies and programs to better help kind of protect and promote child health and well-being, this is something you've thought a lot about. And so I'm just curious, what arguments are you finding are working um, to try to build the consensus that the First Lady spoke about that's now really emerged in Iceland, that this isn't just a women's issue or it isn't just a kind of parent issue or it isn't just a, I'm caring for you know, an aging parent issue. It really is all of our issues, even if none of that is true for us in any given moment. Yes, absolutely. I think, if anything, the pandemic helped us understand the concept of shared fate, and we are now responding to that. And I do see some hope in that space, but it took women to leave the care, child care sector, leaving 80,000 open jobs, not returning because of their lack of pay and benefits, which then allowed the, the corporate sector to understand that without childcare, we don't have the productivity and the access to workers, which then allowed us to understand then what a worker pipeline looks like. And we can't at a pandemic create a pipeline that we should have been creating at early childcare. And so as we now are looking at that cycle and understanding that we all have to benefit from an interconnected ecosystem of how you create a pipeline and spur the economic engine for this country, we're now actually seeing people working 
with this interconnectedness. And so the corporate sector is engaging in conversations and understanding that childcare is essential. And we're also understanding that a great childcare gives a child a great start for then entering an entrepreneurship or a worker's pipeline. And it all then provides for how we create the true care providers and the people who continue to build our ecosystem across the economy. So we're now seeing that and we're excited by that. And we know that when people understand that thriving children are connected to working families and working families must be part of equitable communities. That's how we build the interconnected workforce that allows our country and our nation to grow. And so that is the work that we're doing at the Kellogg Foundation. And I wonder if I can ask you one quick follow-up. Um, do you see kind of that growing, not only awareness of the challenge, but kind of commitment to kind of building kind of the enlightened pathways, even if it has to be kind of articulated in that way for their own kind of you know, commercial um, understanding. Do you see that being more true in some parts of the country than other, or in some industries or size of employers? I'm just curious, kind of are there similarities across kind of who you're seeing as finally stepping up to change their own kind of workplace policies, practices, benefits programs? Yeah, and I do think it, it starts in a local space, uh, and I can give Michigan as an example. Um, what has come out? a shout out, out from Michigan. Yes, Michigan. <laughs> There's great work happening across the nation, but in Michigan, for example, a new project ha has emerged, which is called the TriShare Initiative. And in the TriShare Initiative, one third of child care is provided by the employer. One third is provided by the state and one third by the family. This model is proving to be very successful and is addressing key issues around affordability, access to child care, and uh, then availability of workers. And what we're seeing is the success of this is something that can be replicated then across the United States. So we're pr proving out models and beginning to think about what, where's the innovation in this and how do we all step up and join in to make this work for everyone. That's great. Um, Jen, I know you've kind of described your mission as helping to build the missing infrastructure. Uh, that so often is really kind of the challenge confronting kind of women and families broadly that isn't so much what we can see it what is what doesn't exist yet. Yep. What does that mean in practice and what are you most kind of you know, enthusiastic about is really being able to help kind of build a more robust, equitable yep. care economy? I mean, I think it's just, we talked about this before, we went on stage, and you take such a structural approach to what you do, and so do we as investors. Um, we're an early stage fund that really believes in building this missing infrastructure to support the overlooked needs of women and working families. And we feel like it's a trillion, we know actually, not feel, <laughs> we feel it, but we also know that it's a trillion dollar opportunity hiding in plain sight. Um, that should be invested in, and it includes the future of inclusive work, the booming care economy, um, and it includes the new wave of progress um, and financial health for families. Um, we, COVID, I mean, I think this is really interesting. We, we felt that COVID basically made everything that was invisible, visible, and it was never gonna go back. Um, and we had this thesis around investing in three key categories, which is care, career, and household consumer. And we said we had this thesis before COVID, and then post-COVID, we were drinking through a fire hose of opportunities. There were so many founders, um, startups, engineers, people coming out of the woodwork, people who maybe haven't even lived the problem, wanted to find solutions that we wanted to invest in. Um, so structurally, uh, we believe that we can stitch together these companies and build a, a new platform, a new infrastructure, um, so that all women and working families can thrive. You know, and you know, First Lady, I'm curious, uh, 
kind of to go back to kind of what admittedly I embedded in my first question to you and that you then, you know, picked up on, which is that you're not yet a gender parity. For those kind of on the outside looking in, who think maybe Iceland is this sort of halcyon place where kind of women, you know, have kind of full rights and inclusion and agency, what are actually the challenges that still exist and how are you building coalitions to tackle those? It's a great question. I mean, there's a, there's a number of things. Number one, um, intimate partner violence and gender-based violence. Uh, you can't achieve gender equality uh, when you have uh, gender-based violence. And Iceland, you know, has what we call the Nordic paradox, where in the Nordic countries, we actually see higher reported rates of gender-based violence than in many other countries. And that, we don't know exactly why that is, but it's probably because of, uh, you know, more trust with the police to report things, less stigma to talk about it, and a broader definition of what constitutes uh, intimate partner violence or gender-based violence. Having said all that, it's still there. And, um, and there aren't enough cases that actually go to trial and maybe not, arguably not enough support uh, for victims. And so that's a huge area. Uh, two other areas I would say are to do with finance and investment. Uh, we are not seeing enough money being invested by women or into women-led organizations. Uh, and and not enough women running publicly traded companies. I, I wrote a book a couple of years ago on, on gender equality in Iceland, and at the time when I wrote the book, there were more men called Arni running publicly traded companies in Iceland than there were women. Arni is a popular name in Iceland, but <laughs> nevertheless. <laughs> Um, and you know that that has changed since then, but it's still very slow. And I and, and the third thing that I would say that we need to to work on a lot, uh, and I experienced that myself because I, I'm originally from Canada and I'm an immigrant to Iceland, is being very intersectional in our approach and remembering as we work towards greater gender equality that that is not for one group of people. Uh, we can't leave uh, women of color, women of foreign origin, women with disabilities, trans women, queer women, or, or any other groups behind. We have to be working towards creating greater equality for everyone. You know, Jen, I'm curious how kind of what the First Lady spoke about also comes into your work. Kind of, you know, all of the different additional challenges, bluntly, that often um, women confront. I mean, when, you know, one in three women globally has suffered intimate partner violence, gender-based violence, um, when we know that in much of the world, uh, when families have to make choices between whether to send a boy or a girl to school, they send the boy and keep the girl home. Um, how do you, you think about that? How do your founders grapple with the additional challenges, but also then hopefully kind of the empathy is a superpower, kind of when they do really understand a challenge that they've lived, do you think that they're more likely to succeed because they're more likely to persist? I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I don't really, I'm not sure how to answer that question, to be honest. Um, I think, um, I don't know. I, 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 maybe you want to rephrase that question for me. I don't know. I just think, I think sometimes we think of all of our challenges as only burdens. And I think sometimes they teach us how to be more fierce problem solvers. I think Lejeune knows what I'm talking about. She's nodding a lot over there. <laughs> and I think that when you're investing in women, um, it's important to recognize that it is often harder to be a woman, candidly, particularly when even as you know, the First Lady Eliza Reed was saying, you know, even in Iceland where so much progress has been made, you know, there were more men named Arnie, yeah. right? Or here in the United States until recently there were more men named John, James, or Robert on corporate boards than there were women. Yeah. Um, and so just curious, because you talked about kind of that lived experience of COVID um, a broader definition of just the lived experience of being a woman, yeah. of being a caregiver. I mean, I think it just uh, goes a little bit back to the point, sorry, I, I, I want to pick up on, which is um, I think when we think about where money is going or why we're investing in the space that we're investing in, um, a large part of that is thinking about how this is not niche. It's not just a woman's problem. This is everybody's problem. I think we know, you know, 42 million Americans right now are taking care of people that are over the age of 50. Caregiving after retirement is the number one reason why people leave their jobs. And when you leave your job, you leave wages on the table, and it's been estimated $522 billion of lost wages. I mean, this is real stuff. It's an economic problem. 
Um, it's a labor market problem. You know, so it goes beyond just this is a woman's problem. Um, and I think that that's how we need to look at it if we're really going to make change. Um, well, June, I'm curious, you know, at the Kellogg Foundation, kind of how do you see other aspects of your work also intersecting here? Kind of other aspects of your work to better support child well-being also intersecting with helping kind of better support their parents or their grandparents or kind of the others in their lives who might be caring for them? Yeah, it's all interconnected, and, and that's how we look at it. And so, you know, when we are looking at any issue, we look at it from a lens of uh, racial equity, community engagement, who's involved, and the leadership. And women uh, can be in that leadership role and typically step up in ways that are action-oriented. And it's funny, we were talking about that earlier today. And um, I think about an example. So we know, for example, that uh, disinvestment, particularly in communities of color, is palpable, right? And uh, what we have been doing in our own community of Bat in Battle Creek is thinking about what would it look like if we were to just reinvest in comparable levels across the community, so create an equitable community. And we've done so, and by doing so, we actually invested $50 million in the public school system because it had been disinvested for decades. Immediately, we increased early childhood experiences our children in our community went from 15% ready for kindergarten to 50% ready for kindergarten in a very short time period. Our graduates are now identifying colleges that they're going to. The high school is now an, an academy, so you can actually major in healthcare or STEM or education in high school. What's happening is we're starting to see there's a woman who's uh, the superintendent of public schools. There's a woman mayor, basically the general city manager. Uh, there's myself leading the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And what you're seeing is when that leadership steps up and they're committed to changing things and having the courage to change things, Results happen, and that's what we're tracking. And what we're proving is, you know, we're not talking about exorbitance. We're talking about comparable, equitable solutions that communities can engage in that will create equitable outcomes for everyone in the community. And that's boldness that we're taking on. Lejeune. I guess because I have the microphone, I'm just going to talk about one of my pet peeves for a moment. Um, one of my pet peeves is when we accept the language in budget discussions of, oh, well, we're cutting the costs for education. Like, no, you're not. You're cutting the investment in education. We're cutting the costs for early childhood. No, you're not. You're cutting the investment in early childhood. We're cutting the costs for supportive services for people on Medicare, people on Medicaid and Social Security with disabilities. No, you are cutting the investment in ensuring that everyone in your community can live a life with dignity and agency. And so I just, I so strongly appreciate what you just shared. And I would add, we're about to do it again, because if we allow the benefits that were provided during the pandemic to expire, like they will expire soon, the child at tax the the credit month. at the end of the month, we're doing it once again. It proved that with the proper investment, we can close gaps, gaps that have been structurally there for decades, that now we see a path forward. And if we watch that disappear, we will also suffer the consequences of the gaps that we are currently trying to deal with, like underemployment and inability to hire, uh, you know, lack of childcare, and then lack of preparedness 
for future thriving of children. We are seeing it and hopefully this cycle won't repeat itself. Well, I know um, we're running out of time, but I do wanna ask uh, both uh, First Gen and then the First Lady for final thoughts, because I do think um, while of course all of these issues are human issues, they also are ones that disproportionately affect women. And I do think we need to be centering women in uh, tackling these challenges uh, and in building sustainable solutions for all of us. And so, um, yeah. Jen, please, any final closing thoughts and then um, yeah. to the First Lady. I mean, sometimes I feel like both Eliza and I live in Scandinavian countries so that we live a little bit in the future. Um, <laughs> so we can see things, yeah, worse weather, true. But we can um, see things that are, again, structurally um, sound in many ways. I think for me, um, when I think about what would make you know, a, a really amazing outcome for all of this, it's one, I think, is that care um, is clearly, it's, it's valued, it's seen, it's acknowledged um, in society. I think, going to your point, I think that government um, clearly plays a role where they see this as an economic need, not just a, a women's or mommy need. Um, and another thing that needs to be addressed, by the way, is that um, working women, for example, are exceptionally anxious about, you know, there was a New York Times study that was just done, a survey that was just done that said 80% of women are, have high anxiety around trying to be perfect moms. And by the way, 70% of them are financially unsound. So we just are living with these, and grappling with these issues, and um, maybe, hopefully, we get some structural um, solutions to it and investment into it to, to make it better. I, I mean, I agree also with, with what Jen said there, and again, this advantage of being in the Nordic countries with that welfare state model where we pay very high taxes because we know that for those taxes, we get universal free health care. And, um, you know, our, our by law, we're not quite there. Two thirds of our preschool teachers are meant to have a university education and preschool education. Our midwives have to be university educated to be midwives. And, you know, there's a real investment, as you say, in care there. But maybe if there's one point that I, I hope to leave everybody here with, and I loved the point that you made in the panel earlier about this this idea of being overwhelmed by inertia sometimes, in the sense, I, th I think that's how you phrased it, that something, working towards things like gender equality seems so massive, and sometimes I think we think, well, maybe I'll vote for officials who will introduce policies, and it's very trickle down. And, and I think if we are not the policymakers ourselves, it's hard for us to think what we can do. And, and, I, and I really hope that, that through examples of Iceland and, and knowing um, amazing and, and wonderful women that we all know and that are in all of our communities, we can realize that we may not all individually change the world, but we can certainly all nudge things in the right direction. And we're certainly all role models. And we can all be doing incremental things, whether that is you know, beyond policies, uh, elevating the voices of other women and listening to other women and listening to any sort of marginalized voice, being polite to each other on the internet, imagine that. Um, you know, treating with each other with respect and dignity and consuming arts and media and sports and culture in a more diverse way and with more diversity glasses on. And I think that, if that's a message that I can leave for everybody, it's to think about what we can as individuals all do because collectively it will make a difference. Um, well, thank you uh, to the First Lady, to Lejeune and to Jen for doing more than just nudging us, but really for leading us in the right direction. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.